Hi everyone, this is Ashnut Kothari here. In this particular video, I'm going to be discussing the indicative solutions for CS1A for IIA July 2022 session. A brief commentary regarding the paper. Overall, the difficulty was as comparable to the past years. Well-prepared students would have been able to attempt a high proportion of these questions. So uh, let's take a look and you know, before we start taking a look at all the solutions, would wanted to just inform you all that uh, the batches for the December 2022 session have started. So the classes are being, uh, you know, classes at Fanatics are being held in online mode, in offline mode, as well as pre-recorded lectures are being provided. Along with that, all other, you know, extensive set of preparatory resources, be it the latest version of the material, the past year questions with complete solutions, mock examinations, mathematical typing, just in case the exams are held online in the next session, we would be providing all of these to our students. So in case you are looking to, you know, join classes, uh, feel free to reach out to us as soon as possible. Coming back to the paper. So let's take a look at the first question. List the key steps of a data analysis process. It's direct book work. Then part two, this will be nothing but option B, which is Bayesian statistics only because under Bayesian statistics, my parameter of interest is a random variable in classical estimation. The parameter of interest is not a random variable. You might think we have something called a 95% confidence interval. The interval is something which is random in nature, not the random, uh, you know, uh, not the parameter of interest. Then as for part three, these are the uh, mappings. A is three, B is four, C is two, D is one. So this was question one. Before proceeding further, also I would just like to mention to you all, in case you come up with any sort of errors or you feel that any of the solutions which we have provided is uh, not correct, please feel free to reach out to us through comment section. Let us know that. We will take a look at it. And in case we do identify any errors, we would be you know, rectifying it. And these would be posted in the comments section itself. Next, what we have is question number two. So there are parts one, two, and three, and these are the ways to do it. For the first part, it's a Poisson distribution. For part two, it's a negative binomial type one distribution. So final answer is coming out to be 0 0.1792. Again, just keep in mind, I have, uh, you know, kind of performed all these calculations very quickly. I didn't get the time to proof check them. So in case you do come across any sort of, you know, numerical errors, feel free to reach out to us through the comment section of this particular video. We would be you know, uh, pushing in rectifications for same. And part three, we are using it as a binomial model to begin with, but given the computational time required to compute probability X less than 10, we can approximate to a say as a Poisson distribution. Next question three we have is, uh, we need you know, the two consecutive claims in a health insurance policy follows an exponential distribution with mean mu. So remember that the parameter for the exponential distribution is one by mu and I need to find the correct MGF. Now the trick over here is that, you know, all these integrals zero to infinite e to the power minus z dz. This is nothing but noise because this will give you nothing but one itself. So it's the other part you need to see. It's not given in a format, which is there in the actual tables. So you might have to apply slightly little bit, you know, let's say more manipulation to get the particular option. And whenever none of the above is given, uh, it becomes a bit tricky, you know, because then you need to actually see whether it's exactly matching or not. I mean, usually also it should match, but then none of the above might put in an element, especially, you know, when you're trying to come up with an educated guess, if you're not being able to solve it, you want an educated guess, then the none of the above option makes it a lot more trickier. So this is question part three. We know that for an uh, MGF uh, of an exponential distribution, you can write in this form to begin with one minus mu t to the power minus one. Then what I can do is, you know, I can uh, divide uh, uh, the inside term with respect to mu. And when I take it outside, uh, you know, it comes, let's say in this particular form. Or rather, you know, you could think this can uh, taking mu common out over here. You can think in that way and it comes out outside in the form of mu to the power minus one, which is one by mu. So it comes out to be option B. The next part is if the random variable Y denotes sum of time periods of two consecutive claims of N policies determine the moment generating function of Y. So here, uh, you know, let's say the claims are arriving according to Poisson process one by mu for a single policy, you know, 
Uh, so this is part two and three. I've done it combined. Actually, I'll just explain what I'm trying to do. So for n policies, the rate will be n by mu. Now T1 is the time between the Tth and the T plus 1th claim. T2 is the time between T plus 1th and T plus 2th claim. So basically T1 plus T2 is nothing but time for two consecutive claims. You define a random variable says uh, A, which is T1 plus T2, apply first principles to get the MGF and the MGF which it will be coming will be in the form of gamma 2 by n comma mu. So you'll be basically getting this, the derivation I have not uh, mentioned over here. And this will be nothing but corresponding to a gamma 2 comma n by mu distribution. Question 4, again, this is a very typical question, a similar question, if I recall correctly, is there in the material as well. So let's quickly take a look at the solution for same. Let x denote the claim amount from fixed benefit policy and y be the claim amount from the indemnity benefit policy. x follows normal 1 comma uh, 9 comma 1 square, y follows normal. 14 comma 3 square. Now the probability which I need. Keep in mind we are working in units of hundreds as mentioned in the question. Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 that is the total amount from the indemnity uh, you know benefit policy should be greater than the fixed benefit policy right and we already have 900 claims which is basically 9. Now I basically try to find the distribution of this you know assumption is there we need to mention the assumption assuming that each of these are in fact you know let's say independent and y are identical in themselves, x are identical in themselves, it will follow a normal distribution with so and so parameters, comes out to be 6, 31. Standardizing it, solving it, keep in mind, because the, uh, you know time is always a challenge for most of the students, you can round it off to two decimal places over here and directly observe the values from tables. Best practice is obviously, you know, you should be interpolating and getting the answer, but that is only when you actually have time available, else my expectation is key if, uh, you know, at the most they could deduct, let's say half a mark or at a very, very extreme end one mark for this step. I mean, you could utilize this time to solve something else. It might be more efficient to solve another question rather than spending a couple of minutes or so to get, you know, interpolate this. Then question five, part one, briefly explain, you know, what is meant by ID random variables, direct book work, extremely scoring in part two under the null hypothesis where theta is equal to 0.5. Part A, calculate the probability of the outcome also. So let's take a look at all the solutions. It's 0.5 to the power 5 because it's a set event. Head, 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 tail, half, 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 half. Then the P value of observing at least 4 heads. So either 4 heads or 5 heads. 4 heads probability is this 5C1 into 0.5 to the power 5. 5 heads is exactly 0.5 to the power 5. Note that this 5C1 is there because we have four tails and uh, one head. The total ways to, you know, uh, arrange them is 5C1. So it comes out to be 0 0.1875, which is more than 5%. So we do not have sufficient evidence to reject that 5% level of significance. Part 3, my likelihood will be theta to the power 4, 1 minus theta. B, you can take the log likelihood, differentiate it, so on. We'll get theta hat to be nothing but 0 0.8. Part C, the prior mean, taking 0.2 common out. Uh, you'll be getting at 0.5. D was commentary. Since we see that the prior, basically all possible values of theta are equally likely. So it's nothing but you can think it of to be like a discrete, uh, you know, uniform distribution. You could visualize it in that particular way. Okay, there are five possible ways which, uh, five possible values which theta can take and all of them are assumed to be equally likely. Then for E, it's part C, F part C, G part B, H part D. And then part four, uh, you know, the expected value. Okay, this is some another question, I guess. I started with question five, okay, no, it's okay. So question part five, do we have a goodness of fit test? Okay, yeah. So F, G, H, I, part four. Uh, so far we have assumed that each coin is independent of the previous, uh, you know, toss. It is now desired to test this assumption. Part A, state with reason whether the chi-square test can be used for this purpose considering the sample of 8 coin tosses as above. And then there's a contingency table given over here. We need to find the expected value. You will see that all the entries, the expected values will be 5. You need to find the statistic O minus E whole square by E. And there you will see, you know, denominator is same. In the numerator, it's either 7 minus 5 or 3 minus 5. And when I square it, both will be giving us the same answer. 
So here you might see what I've done is 7 minus 5 whole square by 5 into 4. It comes out to be 3.2. The 5% critical value is 3.841. Therefore, we have insufficient evidence to reject H0 at 5% level of significance. And then accordingly, you can, uh, H0 is basically, let's say, uh, you know, you can infer accordingly. I mean, we have a standard H0 and H1 for a contingency table test. So it's basically we won't have sufficient evidence to you know reject H naught. That is, I mean, uh, there is not any so form of you no know, like there is no association. We can interpret that. Then question six again a typical question. Uh, it has become I will say a standard you know for these type of questions to be tested in I from CS one. So let's quickly take a look at the solutions. Part one, it's coming out to be three to the power minus three y. That's an exponential three distribution. Then part two, starting with let's say the CDF, I get the CDF. Then I need to find the PDF. So once I have the CDF, differentiating it will give me the PDF, and it comes out to be three e to the power minus three y minus four, where y is greater than four. Then I need to find its expectation. So I've applied it. We need to apply the integration by substitution, which is, you know, let's start with t equal to y minus 4. Proceed forward and then finally you will get an expression in a form which they have in the options and it comes out to be option c. Then we have question number 7. Uh, mu x is given to be b c to the power x and a lot of other parts are given. So let's quickly take a look. So there seems to be a positive linear relationship. So regression model looks suitable. Then for calculation of beta, then alpha, and then correspondingly find the values B and C. All of these are listed. Again, in case you identify any sort of numerical errors, you know, I mean, I'll just suggest after going through this video, re-perform the calculation once at your end, uh, maybe just to cross-check. And if you're getting something else, please feel free to reach out to us through comment section. We'll definitely take a look at it and you know, uh, post any rectification uh, through the comments section itself. Part three, R is coming out to be 0 0.99135, which is a pretty high positive value. So it shows that we have a strong linear uh, relationship and we also had a positive value of beta previously, which you know, ensures the same. A positive value of beta will basically mean a positive relationship. A negative value of beta will denote basically a negative uh, correlationship. Then part four, the coefficient of determination, which is R square, you basically need to square small r. It comes out to be 98.28% and which is a very good fit because we are being able to explain 98.28% of the overall variation. Part five, these are the values I'm getting. For part six, I haven't completed uh, due to the lack of time. So I have mentioned which formula you need to use and then, you know, sigma square, you have the formula, you can put it and substitute it. And then finally, there's a part seven as well. Uh, if I recall correctly, let me just check. Yes. So here you need to comment on the bit of the 95% confidence interval. So you can just take a look at this particular formula wherein, you know, it's something like X naught minus X bar whole square. So further away, the value of X naught to take from X bar, you know, higher would be the, let's say the standard error of it. And therefore higher shall be the width of it. So on this lines, you need to make comments on this question. Then question number eight, I need to find the Pearson correlation coefficient. So let's quickly take a look at them. So it's coming out to be one for both time period one and two. And then for part two, when I readjust the data X and Y appropriately, R is coming out to be minus 0.13. So a, a negative value of let's say a correlation coefficient or a low value does show that both these indices, let's say are independent to some extent. You know, we achieve diversification whenever the returns are, let's say, you know, uh, negatively correlated if possible or with extremely low covariation. So that is the case over here. Question number nine over here, uh, it's from Bayesian statistics. So these are the information which has been given. Let me go through all the solutions. Z has been given n by n plus beta. n is three, beta is one. We get a three by four. We calculate the sample mean and then the prior mean will be 15. And then we get the estimate 16.35. Then in part two, we see by using another model, uh, the variance comes out to be a lot higher. Mean remains the same, 3 by 0.2, but variance comes out to be a lot higher. And this basically shows that we are uh, uh, relying less on our prior distribution because it kind of, you know, let's say has a higher variability. And, you know, which will basically result in us giving a higher credibility estimate to our own data, means a higher value of Z, which we'll see over here. 
once we adjust it uh, with point two, we are getting a higher value of z. Putting this, we get the answer as sixteen point six six seven five. Then question number ten over here. Uh, note that uh, a trick over here is policy wise data is available showing exactly which policies have turned into claims. So you exactly know that this particular policy had this particular sort of claim. So, uh, you know, for likelihood, given that I have the sequence, you know, let's say I have assumed that we are working policy by policy, right? So this policy has one claim or zero claim. Next policy has one claim or zero claim. So on, I know the exact sequence of how, uh, let's say I have got a claim that is my assumption. And on that basis, I'm getting my likelihood to be Q to the power X into one minus Q to the power N minus X. Some of you might think if you do not know the exact order, the way in which, you know, claims did come from uh, policies. In that case, you could have done NCX or uh, you could have multiplied. I am assuming we would be having the exact claims data, let's say. So we know exact uh, date of claim uh, when that will be coming. So we can order it. And so I have removed the NCX term. Again, you know, that will have no other effect on the other of the parts. So it really doesn't even matter. I mean, part one, obviously you might lose marks if, uh, you know, it goes on that NCX will be the correct option, but for the corresponding parts, answer will come out to be the same. So this comes out to be the confidence interval, uh, 0 0.2 is not lying over it. So, uh, we do reject H naught. And then finally we have question number 11, which is on GLM part one, straightforward book work. You know how to deal with this sort of question for a binomial distribution modified by dividing it by N. Part two, again, verifying the mean and variance, direct book work. Then we have part three, explain using the model output shown above whether the variable number of assignments is significant or not. So what I can do is I can just check whether this estimate is greater than twice of the standard error or not. That is an approximate test. If you want to see where it's done, uh, just check the summary of the GLM chapter. You will see this particular test, right? Testing whether a particular covariate is significant or not. So that's what I have done over here. And so we see that mod B hat, uh, you know, mod of B is greater than the twice of the standard error. So it is significant. And then finally, while calculating the value, it comes out to be 0 0.9100. Note that this is the link function and the link function to be used is nothing but the canonical link function, which is log P by one minus P over here. So I hope all of you did find this uh, video extremely useful. Please do like uh, this video, leave your comments in case you would want us, uh, you know, going forward to further improve our videos or you're looking forward for something else as well in these solution discussion videos. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you are updated with uh, all the latest content we come up with. Bye everyone. Thanks.